I bring you greetings and heartfelt affection and love from all the saints and faithful brethren in the states of Oklahoma and Texas where I have the privilege to serve and live and make my life available to people there. And they sure have all their hearts and minds with you constantly, daily, everyone at International. And in this area, as they lift you in perfect prayer and think about you and believe with you all as we walk together in this great family and household. So I give you their love. And I will say and mention, of course, as every guest speaker does at this very hallowed spot, that it's a phenomenal privilege and a splendid honor to be here, standing here, having the joy and thanksgiving in my heart to share my heart by means of God's word with you. And I just thank you so much for being here and for the privilege it is to be alive and to be right here in this place. And I especially thank Dr. Werwell as I did before he left for the joy that he has given me to be here as he's in North Carolina with our wonderful brethren there. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Colossians. I'd like for you to go with me on a um, Masterpiece Mystery Tour. And tonight I'd like to share with you some of my heart concerning the greatest thing, the greatest secret, used to be a secret until God made it known, the most precious piece of information that God ever hid in his heart that he kept secret from since before the foundations of the world and did not reveal it until sometime around the first century to a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. And now you and I today have the joy and privilege to live in this kind of abundance. Last week at our area meeting in Oklahoma City, I was speaking with one of our great believers there, and he was sharing with me an experience he had had, how he was just learning some about ministering, about walking by guidance from the Father, about getting information from God about people's needs and how to help them and how to just bring abundance and blessing to their lives. And he'd been learning some of the principles and keys about how God talks to people. And he was sharing with me an experience he'd had the past week, how he had, his wife was very ill, she'd had a breathing problem, and he had the joy and privilege to minister to her. And how God showed him a most beautiful picture of her bronchial tubes and her heart and all of this stuff and showed him exactly what was wrong and he kicked it out in the name of Jesus Christ and then they spent the rest of the night crying and laughing and singing and all these things. But you see, he had been learning some of the keys and principles about how to walk by guidance and then he had operated them. He had put them into practice. He had seen something happen, and boy, the radiance on his face was fantastic because we are in an understanding life. We're in a heart walk. We're not just head trippers. The world's full of head trippers. The world's full of philosophy and information and things running through the gray matter and mental ascent. We're heart people. We're understanding people, and we're on a mystery tour with this great mystery through life, and that's what had happened to him. A few weeks ago, I was sitting at my desk in my office studying the Word, and I was working this principle of that we are co-workers with God, we are fellow laborers with God, co-laborers, co-workers, and I was just thinking and trying to put this thing together in my mind, and I just stopped and sat back in my chair, and I just said, Father, you're just going to have to teach me this. I just don't understand it. I don't taste it enough yet. I don't quite see where this fits. It doesn't quite gel yet in my understanding. Within one minute, I got a phone call. I picked it up. The voice said, would you minister to me? Sure. So I asked Father what's going on. God lets me know what's happening. Kick the cause out in the name of Jesus Christ. She gets set free, real blessed. Me too. I hung up. I sat down went back to study. I wonder how the Lord's going to show me this now. And then it hit me. It hit me that's exactly what had just happened. That I was a co-worker with God in that situation. God needed me there because that person needed a human being to minister to her in the name of Jesus Christ. He needed a person to give that guidance to that had Christ in them and had the mind and the believing to hear it and then act on it. But I sure needed God because without him I wouldn't have anything there whereby to get any information like that. And without him, I wouldn't give a hoot about helping anyone anyway. But he had just shown me that principle. You see, it took an application, experiential knowledge, getting into the application of that principle before it really hit in my understanding. Colossians 2, verse 2. This verse, if not familiar, will become very familiar to any of you that are going to hang around the Rock of Ages. 
Colossians 2, 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of what? Understanding. Two, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Here's a tremendous verse of Scripture on the mystery. And notice the words. Notice how God is setting forth a challenge to you and I as members of the body, as members of the household, of people that know their rights and walk on them. He says that we might be knit together in love unto. This word unto is wonderful. The particular word in the Greek text, ace, E-I-S, it means the complete length of a vector. For instance, if I said Craig walked unto the piano, that means I got there. See? That means I got there. The other Greek word used in this word usage is pros. It simply means moving in that direction. If I said Craig walked unto pros the piano, that just means I headed that way. You don't know that I got there or not. Dig it? The word ace means I got there, and that's this word. Being knit together in love and unto, completely, my heart completely unto, all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Understanding is not just having something in the brain cells. Understanding is a heart thing. It's got into the tubes of your life. It's into your breath. It's into your bloodstream, so to speak. It's, it's heart knowledge. It's walk knowledge. It's something I can taste. I know. Unto, okay, full assurance of understanding. Two. The word two is that word ace again. Completely there. Got it? Nothing short all the way to the acknowledgement of the mystery. Now, the word acknowledgement means experiential knowledge to the experiential knowledge of the mystery. God hid the mystery. He hid it. He didn't tell anyone. The adversary did not know. The prophets that searched the scriptures diligently, these were real men of ability. They knew who God was. They had a personal walk with the Father. They knew how to work God's word. They didn't find the mystery. He didn't even tell his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were pretty tight. He didn't even tell his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it must be pretty big, huh? It must be the greatest thing that God has ever hid. It must be fantastic. And the Word of God says here that you and I have the privilege, we are challenged, to come to a heart experiential knowledge of this, the mystery. Now, how does that happen? The book of Colossians is a book of correction. It corrects doctrinal error that had crept into the church due to the failure to adhere to the revelation given in the book of what? Ephesians. Correction. To correct, all right? Therefore, this book ties in very wonderfully, very intricately with the book of Ephesians, correct? As a matter of fact, you can document every truth in the book of Colossians. Just read it sometime. Document it in the book of Ephesians. It's wonderful. In other words, the correction epistle is designed to push us back to the doctrine, right? Correction is back to believing how? Right. Rightly. Right. Doctrine is how to believe rightly. Comprendent? Dig? Right. See? So the correction epistle must by nature and of essence just get us back to the doctrine. Get back to it. Get back to it. Get back to it. Everything in here is basically a reiteration of what Ephesians sets forth. Everything in here is basically meaningful repetition about the truth set in Ephesians. Hasn't Dr. Werewell taught us it's the greatest revelation ever given to the church? Ephesians, it's straight doctrine. It's how to believe rightly. It's not reproof. It's not correction. It's doctrine. Colossians and Philippians had to be written because God's people blew it. They got off the trail. They got off the track. So look, to come to the full assurance of the understanding to the acknowledgement, in other words, heart knowledge, I really know in my lifestyle, I really know what it means to live the mystery, to be on this masterpiece mystery tour. I really know what it is, which is the greatest thing God ever hid, never sh showed forth. The truth of it and the essence of getting back to that must lie back where? Ephesians. Ephesians. That's where it's always pushing us back to those truths. Back to those truths. Okay. Ephesians 1. Verse 1, 
How do we get an understanding? How do you get an understanding of anything? Lots of things we have up here, but how does it get into an understanding? To the end that life is a joy. Life is a turn on every day. Life is a consistent up. Life is one of which we're on top of this heap, which is what the world is. It's a heap. Life is something that we just walk in every day. It's an understanding thing. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the what? Faithful. Faithful. Where? In Christ Jesus. Is Ephesians written to tripped out believers? That's not what it says. It's written to the what? Faithful in Christ Jesus. And if I remember correctly, that's talking about household folks, right? People that know their rights in the family and walk on them. All it takes to get into the family is get born again. That's phenomenal. But God's looking for household folks after that happens. And that's who we are looking for. When we hold forth the word, we're looking for household people. People that are going to learn their rights and walk on their rights. And Ephesians is written to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Christ in you is sonship, right? You in Christ is what? Fellowship. This is doctrine. Doctrine. Doctrine's written to people that are going to take it and believe it and walk on it, see? If you blow it, you need reproof and correction. This is doctrine. How to believe right? And if we're going to get to the place where we got a heartbeat knowledge of the mystery, the greatest thing God ever did, the mystery, then it makes sense to go back to the doctrine. And it's got to set it forth in here. How do we do it? How do we do it? All righty. Look at verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, where? In Christ, all right? These things are available in experiential living and experiential application every day to people that are in Christ, to the people that are in fellowship, to people that are faithful, to people like you and I, household folks, see, that want to go on this mystery tour, that want to walk this life. So what are some of the particular details? What are some of these spiritual blessings? It says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now, what does that mean? Okay, it lays it out to us in the next verses. What are those spiritual blessings? And what do they mean? Verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him. We are chosen in him. We are chosen in him. I think if you really read Ephesians and really look, you can see the five sonship rights laid out in these first 12 verses. Just tremendous. You know, those sonship rights, those big long words, justification, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, ministry of reconciliation. Are they just big long words or does it really mean something to our hearts? See, is it an acknowledgement thing? Here we go. He hath chosen us. He hath chosen he hath chosen. Who chose us? God chose us. And that's legally, legally, legal. Nobody can say anything about it. God chose us, and he chose us way back before dad and mom thought about us. He chose us way back before the foundation of the world. That's justification, I'll tell you what. Justification is the legal side of the righteousness we've got in Christ. He chose us. God chose us, right? There's one of those beautiful little details of all spiritual blessings. That's one. And if Ephesians is doctrine... And if Ephesians sets forth the greatness of the mystery, then Ephesians must be understood to start walking in this acknowledgement of the mystery, getting into living this thing, see? Verse 4, that's what I read. Verse 5, having predestined us unto, and literally it reads, sonship, having predestinated us to sonship by means of Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Predestined to sonship, seed. Christ in us, the hope of glory, incorruptible seed. It's legally, legally, legal. It's the legal side of right. It's just legal. Nobody's got anything to say about us losing it or anything. You can't say. It's just you're out of the ballpark. It's done. It's legal. Dig? And in the verse before, it also says we're holy and without blame. That's this righteousness. That's righteousness we've got in Christ. If God's given us the, the legal right spiritually to stand in his presence without any sense of sin, guilt, or condemnation, then it makes sense I can stand in my own presence that way. And it makes sense I can stand in the presence of other people that way. And it makes sense that if that's my legal right, I can learn to acknowledge that and live that way, right? Whereas nobody talks me out of anything. I'm a household folk, right? And I walk and live these principles. Because how many times do you and I live? One time, that's all. 
You get one chance. That's it. Now, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to just get in the family and then misty flat it? Or are we going to household it through life? <laughs> We've made up our minds, right? And to get into the household walk, the household walk, it takes an understanding of the greatest revelation ever given to the church. On we go. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Lovely and acceptable in whom? The Beloved. In the Beloved. In the Beloved. And that's not in the world. That's out of the muck. You see, we used to all be muck truckers, that's all. <laughs> you thought you might have been a trucker in life before you're just a muck trucker. We'll see that in a minute in here. Just slogging along, basically. But we're in the Beloved. We're set apart. That's sanctification. That's what that big, long, hairy word means, in other words. You see, these aren't just big, long words. First time we took the class, that's all they were to me when I heard sonship right. Yeah, maybe I can spell them in two weeks. Yeah. But getting into learning, the acknowledging of these things, because these sonship rights are just another way of expressing that mystery, God in Christ in us, the hope of glory, and acknowledging that, getting into the experiential knowledge of that thing. So see, we're in the beloved. We're sanctified, set apart. Verse 7. In whom we have what? Redemption. We're bought with a price. It's been paid for. We're bought with a price. We are redeemed. Better than green stamps. See? We're redeemed. I saw the ladies laughing on house <laughs> housewives on that. We're redeemed. In whom we have redemption through his what? Blood. The remission of sins according to the riches of his grace. There's redemption. Verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He abounded toward us all wisdom and prudence. That's one of these spiritual blessings that we've got. That's a legal right. That's a legal right. Verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. There it is. According to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. That in the administration of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom also we have obtained and what? Inheritance. Inheritance. There's another one. There's another beauty. That's one of those spiritual goodies that we've got that verse 3 sets for us. One of those spiritual blessings that we are blessed with. Okay? Now what's the point of all this? Why? Why would God bless you and I with all spiritual blessings? I think that's a good question. Why would he do all this? Why couldn't he just done 99%? Then I wouldn't have had as many long words to know. Or why, why, why did he give us all? Why did he give us all of them, see? Why everything? Why all spiritual blessings? Verse 12, that. We should be to the praise of his what? Glory. That's the point of all these things that we should be an honor, a credit to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we should be the living reality, the living manifestation of God's goodness and God's beauty. How many times you heard Dr. Ware will say, people don't read the Bible, they read you, right? That's where it starts. They read our lives and that we should be to the praise of his glory. It must be available. That we should just be a, a beautiful representation of how fantastic God is. It must take some understanding of this mystery, some understanding of these spiritual blessings, these sonship rites, in order for this to start to happen. Verse 17. Here's the prayer that Paul prays by revelation from God, his prayer for the saints at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He prays, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, literally, that reads that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of, my glo of glory, may give unto you spiritual wisdom and revelation knowledge. Now, what's that going to do? The eyes of our what? Understanding. See, understanding enlightened. There's light there. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Spiritual wisdom and revelation knowledge of what? Of the spiritual blessings in verse 3, 4, 5, 6 through 12. In other words, it must be available to, to really learn in everyday practical living at the office, on the job, at school, with the family, with friends, with enemies, with pedestrians, with Democrats. It must be available, Republicans. <laughs> it must be available 
to really get a feel of these tremendous things because it's a, it says right here he prays that the eyes of our understanding be what bingo enlightened light light so we see enlightened our peepers open see we're in the family as we get our spiritual peepers open we're household folks we learn what these truths are and then we get into the living of it you know we receive it we retain it and then we do what release it and that takes some understanding that takes the eyes of our understanding being enlightened to the acknowledging of the mystery heart knowledge see experience i know what it is it's not just a head trip and too many people have tried to prove for too long that life can be enjoyed by just head tripping <laughs> And baloney and we've all tried it too that's not it's see heart thing and it must be available for anybody it's written to the faithful in Christ Jesus to anyone it must be available to get this heart knowledge of God's Word to live it to where it's a living reality it doesn't matter what your educational background what your family your socioeconomic status in the strata and all those other things I learned how to say those. I don't know what they mean yet. All of those things, see, it doesn't make a lick of difference. It makes difference if you're faithful in Christ Jesus because it's available for the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. It's available to have a heart knowledge of the mystery. Why? 18. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? Three basic things. That's the reason we get the eyes of our understanding enlightened. That we may what? No. Know. Boy, the, I think that's the greatest thing that thrilled me when I was a senior at the University of Kansas when I started hanging around with these way folks. That they talked about knowing that they knew him that they knew. See? <laughs> that they talked about being for sure. Because I had been taught so much... You know, the old cliche, you got to take it by faith, brother. You can't really know till you get to heaven, brother. Well, great. <laughs> Boy, what fun is that? To be convinced, because see, true service and true living and true giving can only come from a man and a woman that's convinced. True, genuine service from a man or a woman that's fully persuaded, that's got it in their heart, that just simply knows it. A sold-out person. Those are the only people that get anything done. A sold-out individual. And boy, it just thrills my head and heart to realize that it's available and that I can be and that I am a sold-out individual. I look for that all of my long, short life. <laughs> for something I could just sell out to, something I could be convinced on, something I saw enough, saw enough savvy and genuineness in to just sell out to it. That's people that get things done. Even if you sell out to the devil you're still going to get some things done, right? It's people that sell out that get things done. So get on or get off, and that's our call in this day and time, and I really see that more and more everywhere. We're looking for household folks. We're not looking for misty flat people, see? We're looking for people that'll stand and be faithful in Christ Jesus and give it all they've got to a God that gave us all he had and to a God that's made this mystery available to you and I to understand and live. Chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, this is doctrine, right? It's doctrine. We've got to understand this to get into the greatness of this masterpiece mystery tour, as I call it. Verse 1. Even you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Even who? You. The faithful in Christ. Yeah, it's talking to us, right? It addresses us as faithful in Christ Jesus. Now there's a nice little truth God's going to let us in on here in Ephesians. He's let us in on all these spiritual blessings we've got. Boy, really gets our head in the clouds, right? But this verse and these verses get our feet back on the ground, I think. This gets us into practice. This tells us where we were, and this is everybody. Every one of us, see? This is where we were. We were dead. We were dead. See? Zombies. Mannequins. Just... <laughs> Walking around, existing. That's all. We were dead because no spirit, no Christ in you. And if you don't have Christ in you, basically you're dead. Verse 2. Wherein? Wherein what? Wherein the deadness. See? Wherein in time past ye walked. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't do that. Yeah, well, that's what it says. You faithful in Christ Jesus? This is the way you used to live. Okay, doesn't make any difference. You gave to every charity in the world. 
or you went to every church on the street, every street corner in your town every day of the week, it doesn't make any difference. If you were dead, you're dead, and this is the way you and I lived. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, we, we faithful ones, we household folks, this is where we used to be, we all had our conversation in times past. Conversation means behavior. In the lusts of our what? Flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the what? Flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's where we were. Everything we did, every motive we had, every action we took, you can fit into those three verses. It doesn't matter how neat we looked, or who we run around with or what, before God in Christ started living in us, this is the way we live. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the mind. That's the reason we did anything. That's all we did. And God right here is really setting us up for the renewed mind, right? He's getting us ready for it, to lay it on us here in the chapters to follow. Because see, that's where we were. My dad shared an example of something that happened to him once, and I think this will make it live in your mind. It didn't happen to me, and I praise the Lord for that, he was six years old, and he was heading for the little house out back, right? Some of you gnosis go that. Everybody's lived it. experiential knowledge. And boy, the oldest Halloween trick in the book, somebody would moved the little house out back, okay? And my dad, at the age of six years old, in the twilight, went tripping back to the little house out back, and he went to the spot where that house used to be. And he ended up a few feet down. That's what happened. Now, this is really gonna, I'm really going to tie this in here now. Now, he hollered, and he hollered, and his dad heard him and came sprinting out there, running, and he was up to about here, right? It's like Ted sang up to our eyeballs and sin. And... His dad took his big strong arm and reached down there and grabbed him by the neck of the neck and just jerked him right out of that stuff. That's those first three verses. Verse four, but God. <laughs> first four verses, look at this. Look, here's the rescue, drum roll. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were what? Dead. In what? Sins up to our eyeballs hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. That's what he did for us. We were dead, 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 and we smelled like it too. That's where we were before God rescued us, before he rescued us. That's the only way we lived. Anybody, the lust of the flesh, the desires, of, that's just the way it was. Now, we got God in Christ in us, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the mystery, we're fellow, we're fellow heirs of the same body you see now what put it on in the mind now we got to start washing this stuff off in our head God cleansed us spiritually now the mind walk and if we're going to get to the point where we understand and acknowledge the mystery where it's a lifestyle here's what it takes putting on these wonderful truths in the mind and living and breathing and walking this thing because that's where we used to be see that's where our heads were that's where our lifestyle was all of us now the greatness of this renewed mind walk you see here it comes first chapter 3 verse 1 for this cause I Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles if you have heard of the administration of the grace of God which is given me to you how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may, what? Understand. See, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's it. It's an understanding thing, and it must be available, right? Because this is written to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by spirit. Verse 6, that the Gentiles, here it is, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. 
There's the mystery. This is the thing that it had not even crossed the mind of any of the believers in the Old Testament and in the Gospels. They'd never even considered this. You see, to you and I, we might say, whoa, big deal. Gentiles, fellow heirs, same body. Yeah, great. You know, senses-wise, maybe that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But if this was hid in God, and if, like it tells us in Peter, the prophets searched diligently, and yet it's untrackable, which we're going to read in a minute, it never crossed their brain cells, this truth. It never touched their heads. And these people were fantastic. This thing must be big. And if it's big, look what you and I can do if the Word makes it available to have the eyes of our understanding enlightened, that we can live this, the biggest thing there is. Not even the Lord Jesus Christ. You think he might have searched the Scriptures diligently? But he, did he see the mystery? No, he didn't. We know that from the accuracy of the word. He did not see it because nobody knew it till Paul got it by revelation. It must be big. It must be big. It must be big. And to get into the lifestyle of acknowledging and living this big thing must be just the greatest thing since post toasties. I'll tell you. It must be just incredible. And so there's got to be a way to learn how. Verse 7. Excuse me. Verse 6. You see, there's two parts to this baby. Gentiles, fellow heirs in the same body. That's family, right? You get born again, you're in the family, correct? But look at the rest of it. And what? Partakers. And partakers. That's experiential knowledge. This is household. And partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Live it. Live it that your life and my life is to the praise of His glory, to the praise of His glory. Partake, 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 partake of the promise. That's part of that great mystery. Verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, literally the untrackable riches of Christ. It could not be tracked. Boy, that just hits my mind so big. It couldn't be found. Therefore, it cannot be anything routine. It cannot be anything. It's got to be original. Dig it? This mystery is original stuff. Boy, this is the... This is new wine. This is... What potential is there? And then how do we get into that? It was untrackable. It never crossed their minds. And to make all see what is the administration of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things, period. By Jesus Christ, of course, is scratched. Not in the text. Now, this verse. Oh. And to make all see what is the administration of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. And by the way, he created everything. But what did he hide? The mystery. It must be big. See that? He created all things. What did he hide? The mystery. That's what he hid. That's what he hid. And we read in Colossians that it's available to come to a heart knowledge of this thing that he hid. So how? Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 set the great principles, the great truths, the great spiritual rights and abilities of what we've got in Christ. Now, we know God's Word then tells us how to, right? H-O-W, how to get into this, how to get into the living of this wonderful, fantastic thing, how to become a partaker. We know what we've got because we're fellow heirs in the same body because of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. We know in our mind. Now, how do I get it here? See, how do I get it into lifestyle in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Fort Wayne, or wherever you all are hanging out? New Knoxville, St. Mary's, Sydney, all over the world, wherever you live every day, how do we get it into a lifestyle? Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Ephesians 4. I, therefore... Boy, what a great word. I love to say this. You know, wherefore the therefore? What's the therefore, therefore? You always know, ask yourself when you see that word. The word therefore means there's a principle before and a practical application is going to follow. Therefore, because of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, here's where we go. The prisoner of the Lord beseech you, I beg of you, that ye walk how? Worthy of the what? 
vocation wherewith you are called. You see, we all might have different occupations, but we've all got the same what? Vocation. And he says, walk worthy of the vocation. It's a special call that we've all been given. What's the vocation? Basically, the mystery. Fellow heirs, same body, and partake. That's the vocation to walk worthy of it. Walk worthy of it. It makes sense, doesn't it? Why not? Wouldn't that be a natural response out of our heart to, to a God that did all this for us? You know, I mean by natural, logical response. Look at all this stuff, all spiritual blessings, all these big long words. Righteousness, sanctification, redemption, ministry of reconciliation, sanctification, on and on. Now, it's just a it's just real, real beautiful, logical thing. Walk worthy of it. Walk worthy of it. That's the partaking. That's the acknowledging. That's getting the heart thing of this greatest thing God ever hid, the mystery. That's getting into this masterpiece mystery tour. Walk worthy of the vocation. Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is real interesting. Verse 1, he told each one of us to walk worthy, right? Each one of us to walk worthy. Now, he's going to get into share, sharing with us how. And how are we going to do this? Into verse 2, it says, we forbear one another in love. Well, how'd you get involved in me walking worthy? That's what it says. How did you get involved in me walking worthy of the vocation? What's that got to do with me walking, acknowledging the mystery? And it says we endeavor. That means we work at it. We endeavor to keep unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity between whom? Believers. Well, how'd you get involved in me walking and getting into the mystery? See, How did I get involved in you walking the mystery? Well, that's what it is. It's the body. See, it's the body. And to get into the experiential living, it says forbear one another. It says endeavor to keep unity. It says keep it tight with the believers. Keep it tight with the saints. Verse 12. There were gift ministries given. Verse 12 it says for the perfecting of the saint. Perfecting the what? Saints. saints. Plural. Everybody. See? Faithful link. Everybody perfecting, not just me. Or you, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we, what? All come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That whom? We. Henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love. Who's speaking the truth in love? Just you? Nope. Us. We. 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 What is the mystery? The body, right? It's the family. And it, that's first part. Second part, partake. That's the household. And if I'm going to get into the real knowledge, acknowledging, you know, like we read in Colossians 2, 2, of the mystery, you think I'm going to have to spend some time with the family? Because it's all tying it right back there. Or bearing one another in love. You think I'm going to have to be with God's people a little bit to really understand the mystery? You think you and I are really ever going to get into understanding this greatest thing God ever hid by just going to a meeting place 20 minutes a week? You think it's going to be by just walking into a big huge room and rubbing elbows and shaking hands and then going back, never seeing anybody again? That's what I'm seeing in this, and I'm seeing in this in my work and my life. Just the twig, that's all. The mystery twig, the twig of the mystery. How can you get into the full assurance of the understanding, of the acknowledging of the mystery unless you're spending time with God's people who are just as much a part of that thing as you and I are? Because part of that mystery is to partake, get into the household, live it. And it says the, the way we live it is to forbear one another in what? Love. To endeavor to keep unity between people so that we all come to the full knowledge, so that we all speak the truth in love. And boy, then look at verse 16. From whom? The whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Every joint does its part and the whole body gets blessed. 
that's the walk. See, that's the, that's the way this mystery comes to an acknowledging point in our hearts and lives. Or it's a living thing. It's not just big words, but it's really in my heart and in my breath and in my step. Boy, that's why I just see wonderfully, as you do also, that the twig is the life. The twig is the life. That's where you see the love of God and renewed mind in manifestation. That's where we see the great practical application of this mystery. That's where you see God's people. You see one body. You see us partaking. Just simply being with God's people. And how are we with God's people? We call it twigs. Daily. Family fellowships. So as far as I see it, anybody that really wants to get into life has to be a vital part of that everyday family of God, household of God, living life relationship. How can we get into the greatness of this mystery, which is the family and the household, unless we spend time with each other, huh? Unless I give you a chance for me to learn from you, unless we're blessed by each other's presence, unless we spend time, unless we see, we develop that keen awareness of Christ in others, you see, to the end that we see that wonderful mystery and that wonderful household. And then Ephesians 4, just like God's magnificent word, goes on in verse 22 and following to lay out the details. What do we do now when we're, okay, you want us with God's people? Father, here we are. What do we do? 22. Put off the former conversation, the old man. It's corrupt. We just read that. It's corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit, that is to say, the life of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God was literally created in righteousness and true holiness. Verse 25 tells us to quit lying to each other. Speak every man truth with his what? Neighbor. 26 says, if we get ticked off, don't sin. Be right on. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It says, neither give place to the devil. Where? In the household. That's where it comes first. That's how we get into the acknowledging the mystery. It says, quit stealing. Quit, quit mousing around. Work and help each other so you can bless one another. Verse 29, don't speak garbage out of our mouths. To whom first? Each other. And you know what garbage is? Anything that does not edify. That's what the verse says. <laughs> Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of what? Edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Those hearers, who gets first priority? Household. And that's how we come into that heart knowledge of the mystery. And look at verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That just ties it all up for my life right there. Be kind. Whose first priority? Household. And as I give first priority to the household and walk straight and tight with God, my heavenly Father, and stay faithful in Christ Jesus and make God's people my priority, I'm coming into an acknowledging, a heart knowledge, an experiential knowledge of the greatest truth in the history of mankind, the mystery, and that's life. Father, thank you so very much for your word, and thank you so much for your lovely people and the way they love this word so much and work this word with their hearts. And Father, thank you for twig fellowships running all over this world, and thank you that the most beautiful truths and the greatest taste of real life and real genuine living is in those twigs every day, Father. And thank you that as people walk in the love of the family and the love of the household, that we truly are a partaker of the promise, that we're living life above the routine, that we're on this masterpiece tour of life, and that we're walking in the true greatness of this wonderful mystery. And I thank you for the word and the privilege it is to know it and to know it in our heart of hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>